called it SDF SRN. Uh, but this is a this is basically a work that tries to aim to reconstruct uh, implicit three D shapes uh, that that can be trained from uh, static image collections. Yeah. So, all right. Let's see. It's not. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, Right, cool. So, um, so, so, like, suppose I like you look at the image here. Um, you ba basically see you can easily like we can really easily see like this is a car, and we can kind of perceive what the three structure looks like. Um, but because basically, what we how we train neural network is basically we make a neural network predict a three D shape from an image. So this is a, like a very very uh, naive way of doing this. So we can make three D predictions with neural networks. Um, and the most straightforward way of making these neural networks learn these three shapes is to basically give a corresponding 3D CAP model that's associated with the image and provide direct supervision with it. So you take a 3D shape, uh, you associate it with the corresponding image, and you try to supervise it with the 3D shape. So this is uh, the most direct way of learning 3D uh, shape prediction slash reconstruction. And uh, I, call, I call it like external supervision. And this is the like the very direct way of doing this. Um, so when we train neural networks, we basically need a data set of images and CAM models uh, that's being uh, that's in correspondence. But the problem is that we need to know what the uh, corresponding CAM model is with every image. So for example, like the like SUVs, trucks, uh, racing cars, etc. Et and a lot of the times, we don't really actually know what the underlying three CAM model is within the image. And it's really hard to uh, scale up these annotations as well because we have to do a lot of that, like these uh, CAM model crafting, and this is very uh, laborious and human and takes a lot of human efforts. So this is not really as scalable uh, if we want to train with a very large data set, as for example, if we have like so many cars, um, uh, a data set of so many cars. It's really hard to. Uh, try to take uh, every image and associate with a with a ground truth three CAM model. So this kind of approach is not really scalable. And so what we want to do is we want to try to get rid of this kind of external supervision, and uh, we want to uh, we don't want to re really like rely on these CAM models, and we want to use the image data itself to provide some sort of self supervision. Uh, so. So the question is like, how can we learn from the image data itself, and uh, po potentially using like some kind of uh, practical sources of uh, supervision or annotations to learn to uh, predict these three D shapes. So um, the uh, the uh, the typical approach that people take uh, without using CAT models is to assume that we have the images and the uh, corresponding silhouettes. And silhouettes are uh, a lot easier to annotate because you can basically uh, like like uh, take like mechanical characters and like draw these like contours around these shapes. And this is much easier to annotate uh, than having to associate with uh, these like very complicated cat models. And we want to use like these uh, source of annotations as a source of practical supervision to learn to these shapes. And so this goes uh, actually goes a very long history back uh, in the 90s, uh, 1980s, I think. So uh, so traditionally, this is called a shape from silhouette problem. And and there's a lot of uh, very old works that's being uh, that's used the similar concepts to try to reconstruct like visual halls. So so in 1994, so this is like the uh, the first time the concept of visual halls has been introduced. Basically. Uh, if we know like the camera poses and we know like what these silhouettes looks like, you can basically try to find the value intersection of uh, what the uh, what the unprojected uh, uh, volumes would look like, and you can basically get something like this. Um, and if you have like a, multi, uh, a lot of viewpoints, then you basically will have a reconstructed three D shape. Um, and also like a very related work is is the uh, space carving work uh, in two uh, two thousand. Uh, to the year 2000. And this is actually a best paper in, in ICCV 1999. Uh, so this is these are like very classical works on um, that surrounds the problem of shape from silhouettes. And if we take the this kind of like, uh, concepts to modern deep learning approaches, basically uh, this uh, this is a, a 
this basically tries to enforce like multi-view consistency across different viewpoints. Um, so suppose that like, we have like um, uh, multiple observation, observations of the same object um, that's looking at the same object. So we can basically say that uh, the pre uh, predictive or generate 3D shape will have to uh, have the uh, consistent projections across different viewpoints so that uh, the 3D object will look reasonable. So that's basically the uh, main intuition of having multi-view supervision uh, supervised by multi-view like uh, observation of the of the same object. And uh, this, uh, I think this goes back of uh, starting like 2016 and and there's also uh, some of these uh, really works in, in 2017. Um, basically they do like volumetric reconstruction uh, using uh, multi-view supervision to try to learn to reconstruct these objects. So, um, and, and then in 2018, I think, uh, so people have started to just, uh, investigate different kinds of uh, 3D representations uh, such as meshes. Uh, and the, uh, the main advantage of meshes over uh, volumetric uh, representations is that basically uh, it's obviously that uh, meshes can we, can, we can kind of like uh, define arbitrary precisions with meshes. And, and with volumetric uh, representations, you, it, it's basically a discretized representation um, over these uh, pixel, uh, pixel coordinates, uh, not pixel coordinates, sorry, uh, 3D coordinates. So it's basically a discretized version of, uh, of the 3D shapes. And, and with meshes, we can, we can basically define uh, arbitrary precisions, uh, such as like floating points with the, uh, with the, with, with the point, uh, mesh vertices here. So in 2018 and 19, people have been starting to investigate uh, what, uh, how we can do multiple supervision for these kind of like explicit surfaces uh, using like 3D meshes. So this work is called soft grass browser, and it's a pretty nice work where we basic, basically say that uh, we can uh, try to uh, try, try to bridge like a try to bridge a connection of like these silhouettes between and, and these uh, render uh, projections and how we should deform the mesh vertices to, in, in order to make these meshes uh, consistent across different viewpoints. And they got like a pretty nice result. We you can see that uh, if we have like a 2D image, we can basically construct uh, these uh, pretty nice meshes, which uh, are uh, dense and continuous. And, but, uh, but meshes have some obvious problems as well. So, let's, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what the drawbacks are of uh, with these kind of approaches from here. Um, so, so first of all, is that uh, mesh representations are still not very ideal uh, for like uh, object shape predictions. And the first thing to note is that it is still a discretized representation. It's just discretized in a, a different way than the voxels. So for voxels, we it is kind of like discretized uh, using like cuboids. You can imagine like. A, a, you can imagine like voxel representations as like uh, small building blocks of uh, cubes that's being assembled together to form a shape. Um, but for meshes, it's basically disc discretized uh, on the surfaces. So you can have you ha you basically had will have to define a predefined a uh, number of uh, of like mesh faces that's being assembled to form like a, a entire mesh object. And what people typically do is that uh, it's uh, what people typically do is that they try to predict the shape by deforming the mesh vertices to, in order to make the uh, outer shape um, consistent across different viewpoints. And so, so the shape topologies is uh, typically predefined. And, and there are some kind of like other approaches that, that tries to tackle the problem of like uh, varying these shape topologies, but it, this typically tend to be very messy here. Um, so in contrast to like some of these like more recent, uh, more recent works in back in 2019 and in 20, uh, people have been starting to investigate how we can represent shapes as implicit functions. And so, so this is actually a more ideal uh, re representation in terms that it is a continuous representation, but it can also uh, model arbitrary smoothness and arbitrary shape topologies. So you can imagine like if we have like a chair with these different uh, legs, or if we have like uh, these uh, 
bars at the back of the back of the seat. Um, if we use like mesh, uh, meshes as the representation, uh, it's basically really, really hard to try to uh, model all these kind of different topologies that we can encounter in the real world. So implicit surfaces are uh, advantageous uh, in this regard. And the second thing is that um, these kind of like work starting from these visual hall work to, uh, to these, uh, uh, these more recent uh, reconstruction with meshes, um, a lot of these works always require uh, multi-view supervision. So by multi-view supervision, meaning that we have to know uh, that we have the uh, different multi-view observations of the same object at training time. So we need to have multi-view observations in, in order to try to reconstruct a uh, entire 3D shape here. And this is kind of impractical because um, it's not really general, uh, scalable to the real world because if we want to, if, if you imagine like a real world video here, uh, it's pretty impractical to annotate every frame uh, with these like, object silhouettes. You have to basically like stop at every frame and then draw these like shape contours. And it's, this is not really a scalable approach. And so most of the experiments up to, the, up to this point are still limited to ShapeNet. And this is not really a, a very generalizable to real world settings. Um, and some people may argue that we can basically run like instant segmentation, like, like Max Garcia and or point, point rent uh, on these like video frames. But uh, these are also still like 2D methods and there's no guarantee that there, there'll be like multi view consistent across different viewpoints. So the, um, so I, I would guess, I would argue that you can, we might be able to uh, uh, predict, you might be able to learn some reasonable 3D shapes, but not as like multi-view uh, consistent. And if you really want to kind of like try to reconstruct very precise 3D shapes, you'll still want to go with like uh, human annotations where we can like draw like very precise contours around these uh, object shapes. So- Sorry, uh, can I interrupt for one, one question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so when you say the implicit uh, representation, implicit surfaces, they can uh, allow arbitrary shape topologies. Uh, I wonder, does this also apply to the shape that are non-watertight? Because if it's non-watertight, it's hard to define whether it's inside or outside, right? Then how would you define the, the like for instance, the sine distance value or what? Yeah. Um... I, th I think I think like uh, the the cases that we 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 are uh, interested in we, we assume that we are considering all uh, watertight uh, watertight shapes. So um, so for implicit surfaces, I think uh, by um, uh, if we want uh, by definition, if we want to define like a uh, uh, well, I, I guess well, I guess it, implicit surface doesn't necessarily have to be watertight. So um, wait, sorry, could could you repeat that question again? So I'm uh, just thinking. Of, I'm just thinking in the form of like sine distance functions, right? Mm -hmm. If if the shape is non water type, how would you um, know whether it's inside or outside, right? Because usually it's like if the surface is defined as the zero level set between yeah. positive and negative, right? Mm -hmm. Then how would you define, for instance, if there's a sphere with a hole, then how would you define that surface? Yeah, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, because you said arbitrary, so I'm just wondering. Is there any constraint over here or what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me think about it. I don't. I I never really thought about this question before. Um, okay, no worries. I'm I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I think I think it's an interesting question. I'm not I'm not sure if like like implicit services are watertight by definition. I I think there are some edge cases where if the surfaces might not be watertight. Um, but I think like, if we consider like these uh, well-behaved, uh, I, I think in most well-behaved uh, cases, uh, most of these implicit surfaces should be watertight. If we have like a, if these, uh, if these implicit fields are defined like some uh, continuous functions. And, and so that, um, so by, uh, so naturally these uh, implicit surfaces will be, will be like a, a closed surface. Um, I, th I think there are some, edge, there might be some edge cases where surface might not be watertight, but yeah, but I think this is an interesting question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. 
All right. Um, so, so we can basically start. Uh, we, we can basically do like a comparison of uh, what these uh, pr previous work uh, previous work stands. So with at least like neural mesh render and soft rasterizer, it's basically uh, there are uh, 3D mesh reconstruction methods that uh, that requires multi view uh, during training. And and there there, there has been a uh, work uh, by Andrew Kanazawa where uh, where they tried to like. Uh, predict the uh, mesh reconstructions using only single views only. So they can start trying to learn these uh, shape uh, reconstructions from uh, natural image collections. So this, so, uh, so this, is, this has been an effort uh, in ECTV 2018. And regarding like these uh, multiple reconstruction using implicit surfaces, there are different methods using, uh, uh, there's a work called differentiable volume metric rendering. And there's also another work called SDFDIF. Uh, there, Concurrent works on learning um, implicit surfaces without 3D supervision, and but they still kind of require um, multi-view during uh, during training. And so, so where my work here stands is that we want to tackle the uh, the, uh, the case where we try to reconstruct implicit surfaces where we only have single views during training. So, so this is where we want to uh, investigate here. Yeah. Does anyone have any uh, more questions here up to this point? All right. Um, if not, I guess I can. I'll just go on. And um, please feel free to uh, stop me at any point. All right. Um, so, so back to the case where we uh, uh, where we just talked about before. We want to uh, learn uh, to reconstruct implicit surfaces from a large data set where we have uh, images and silhouette annotations. And use them as a source of practical supervision, and the uh, re representation that we use, uh, we want to reconstruct is 3D SDF, and it's basically assigned distance functions. And for those who are not not as familiar with uh, SDFs, it's basically like a, a function where defined in the 3D space, where uh, where the surfaces are defined by the zero level set uh, in the 3D space. Uh, we can write it as like f of x equals zero, where f is the uh, assigned distance function. And all the points that had that uh, that outputs the value zero are defined to be on the surface here. So it depends on how, what the function uh, is learned to be uh, is learned to be like. These uh, these surfaces can take on different forms, and they can kind of like uh, form ob uh, other to uh, arbitrary topologies as well. And also, they, they uh, obviously they have the advantages of um, forming dense continuous surfaces and um, so, so the um, the way we kind of like learn 3D SDF is, is that we kind of want to draw a connection between like 2D silhouettes as a source of supervision for 3D SDFs here. So how we do it is is that we can basically draw a connection uh, in a geometric sense. So suppose that we have an image here of a, like a Stanford bunny, and we can define a 2D pixel coordinate as like a SU here. And what, so what we can do here is that we can find a we can try to compute the distance to that's closest to the silhouette, and uh, which we call D of U here. And so, and we can do this for every pixel. And this basically forms like a distance transform map. So for every pixel, it's basically, it, it can encode the distance to the, uh, to the 2D, 2D silhouettes. And you can see that this is actually very, very similar to, uh, to the 3D SDF that we just see before. And you can, you can, we can also we can even kind of like imagine it to be like a two D form of two D SDF here. And so the thing the thing to note is that uh, because it, this is a distance transform, uh, for each pixel in the free space, we can if we draw like a circle around these uh, uh, around these uh, around this uh, uh, U, pixel U here, um, by definition every pixel uh, every pixel within this circle will must also be a free space here. So. So if we kind of like visualize it in the 3D, 3D space here, we can basically try to uh, back project this, uh, this circle here to form like a 3D cone here. So because every pixel inside this circle must be free space, then in the free space, every 3D point inside this cone, 3D cone must also be free space here because this is by the definition of the distance transform. So, so if we kind of like back project this pixel u here 
into the 3D space, if we, if we cast it into the ray uh, in 3D, and if we kind of like randomly sample sample an arbitrary value of the depth here to uh, to get a 3D point here, the um, the distance uh, we can basically try to derive like a lower bound on the SDF value, which is basically defined by the uh, distance of this 3D point to the conic surface, right? So we can basically like draw a, a sphere that uh, that's being inscribed by the uh, this uh, projected 3D cone here, and this forms a lower bound because we we know that not uh, all, every any 3D point inside this cone must be free space and cannot be occupied by the by the object shape. So we can so this basically serves as a, a tight lower bound of what the SDF value can take can take on. So um, mathematically, I'll just like skim through this math here, but we can basically write a, a mathematical expression of what the lower bound will look like. And I would just like skim through the math here and because it's not very, very important to the centric story here. But, but the essential thing is that we can basically use this as a, a loss function because we know that this is, uh, we have a lower bound that's bounding the SDF value for each 3D point uh, for each pixel. Uh, and and we get, because we can do it for each pixel and we can randomly sample the 3D point along the ray for also for each pixel. So basically we'll uh, have a statistically a very dense supervision for all the 3D points inside the 3D space. Uh, that's being outside the shape contour that is. So, um, so a valid 3D SDF shape should satisfy this kind of a constraint everywhere in the 3D space. So we basically uh, form this as like, like a loss function where, where this is basically takes on the uh, very similar form to a max modern loss. So if the so the if the constraint is satisfied, then we don't impose a loss here. Um, but the if it is vice versa, then we uh, give it the loss to backpropagate to the neural network. And um, and a, a more advanced uh, version of it is to uh, um, to add some kind of important sampling along the uh, along the silhouettes, where we kind of like uh, assign different weights to uh, according to the distance to the silhouettes, and we uh, we kind of like we can kind of like assign heavier weights. With uh, with these three D points that's uh, closer to the two two D silhouettes and lighter, uh, vice versa here. So this is how we can kind of like connect uh, these two D silhouettes to uh, to learn these uh, kind of like three D shapes here uh, in in the form of SDF. Okay, so and now uh, and the next thing that we we can note is that. Um, we can try to like also try to like predict what what the SDF value uh, should look like uh, in, at the front of the camera. Like what we can try to also predict what the depth would look like uh, by doing some kind of like ray tracing operations. And so ray so for ray tracing, we basically uh, this is a classical uh, uh, a very standard uh, procedure in computer graphics uh, where we try to uh, assuming that we know like the uh, like the implicit surface, uh, implicit SDF field, we can basically do like uh, some form of like sphere tracing to to try to uh, re render what the uh, depth of the uh, of the corresponding pixel should look like uh, by trying to do like some kind of like tracing operations and and solving for the uh, intersection of the with the with the uh, of the sine system function of f of x equals zero. So, um, so this is. Um, and if, um, and there's like uh, there's been a previous work on uh, making this kind of like uh, operation differ differentiable uh, using like a differ differentiable ray marching. And this is a uh, this is a work on 2019 by Vincent. Uh, basically, the main idea is basically saying that uh, we can try to enroll this uh, kind of procedure with a new recurrent neural network uh, and making it differentiable and learnable end to end. So, so we take advantage of this uh, kind of like uh, operation, and we try to enforce that uh, the the endpoint of the the end tracing point should be uh, should be lying on the uh, implicit surface of f of x equals zero. And and what we actually uh, uh, in terms of like uh, more detailed uh, technical details, we can basically try uh, try to say that. Uh, so th this is actually going into a little bit more details. Of of what uh, what I've been trying to do here, so uh, so we can so basically we we can take the second last uh, tracing step and the final tracing step 
and we can kind of impose the laws to enforce uh, different scientists and fields for these two different points. So we, we basically have like a regularization of enforcing that this, uh, the, N, the M, N minus one point step should be, uh, should be a positive uh, sign distance and the, and the last step should be a negative sign distance here. So if we, uh, if we have, if we can use, take advantage of this kind of like regularization and enforce, uh, enforce, these, uh, uh, enforce these signs here, then we can guarantee that there will be a intersection, uh, there will be a root uh, of, of a solution where f of x equals zero here. So this is so, and then we can basically use some refining algorithms to solve for where this f of x equals zero should be. And we can uh, so one very a simple example is to use the bisection method to iteratively solve for where the uh, where the actual three D point that lies on the uh, implicit surface of of uh, of the zero lemma set here. So. So we, we basically use like a, this bisection method to find a zero crossing using this method. And, and then we can try to uh, predict the colors uh, from, this, uh, from this zero crossing here to render uh, the color, uh, color pixels of the, uh, of the corresponding 3D point. And the key thing to note here is that uh, rendering these RGB colors will actually still uh, help solve, these, uh, solve for these different shape ambiguities even from, from single views. Um, because you can kind of imagine, uh, like you can imagine these uh, appearances to be useful to resolve these ambiguities because, uh, because we know that if we don't have multi-view supervision and we, there's basically, there will basically be an infinite number of uh, different solutions that we can tackle. But if we use this, if we take advantage of this kind of like differentiable ray marching algorithm, uh, it is much easier to find a, a sol solution uh, that's in more of like a, in a semantic correspondence that that's more like in a semantic correspondence between multiple uh, multiple single images and that best explains the uh, different variations within the same object categories. So this is kind of like why even uh, you rendering RGB colors and trying to enforce these uh, rendering laws will also help solve, resolve these shape ambiguities even even when single views are only uh, present. In the at training time. Hey, Chen may I ask uh, for a specific example here? Yeah. So when you say like render RGB values, we saw shape ambiguities, are you saying, for example, all the cars would have black tires and then that that's that's correspond to the same thing for even for different cars in different views? Is that what you're referring to or? Uh, yes and no. So so I th I think like if it, in the case where all the like like for for cars where the tires like the tires are, are all black, then I think I, I think this is a, a much easier case where we can just like take a pick, uh it's basically a different form of like multi-view supervision where we just like enforce uh color cons consistency across different viewpoints. But uh, there are a lot of cases where uh where the where we have to we don't have explicit uh RGB values to enforce these uh, multi-view consistency, uh, then, so for example, if we, we can imagine like uh, different cars that, to have different colors, um, but, but uh, so, some of these colors have uh, regular patterns as well, because like, for example, uh, we, don't, we don't really have like some arbitrary colors, uh, like yellow, col uh, yellow regions within, on a red car, right? Um, so this kind of like a uh, semantic uh, Patterns and regularities are also useful for trying to associate um, uh, cor uh, correspondences that are not explicitly in RGB values, but rather uh, learnable by uh, in a more semantic way. I think that's a one way to. I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think there's a very. Uh, I don't think I have a very uh, solid explanation of 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 how this uh how to explain this as well but i think the best way to explain why this works is to use a uh, some form of like semantic correspondences to explain why uh why these like differential ray marching will still uh, tend to find a best solution across uh across uh, single images All right. yeah yeah so 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 the um 
So basically, uh, we uh, also predict the RGB uh, losses here, uh, where we try to uh, enforce the uh, rendered uh, pixel color to be the same as the um, RGB values that we that we see here. Okay, so um, so before I go into the some of the experiments, I think I kind of like want to make a important distinction of like of what the multi view supervision is actually means because I think this got a lot of confusion when I submitted this paper and the reviewers were uh, a little bit confused about my experimental settings. So I kind of wanted to make a, a distinction here. So with multiple supervision, we basically say that we have an input image. We try to predict the shape and, uh, and, we, and then we can randomly because, and we can randomly supervise it with different viewpoints. And this relies on the explicit knowledge of, we, of knowing what, which images are uh, are associated with the same three D shapes? So we can so during training we can randomly uh, we can know which images corresponds to the same count model, and we can randomly uh, sample these different viewpoints to learn uh, statistically an overall good three D shape here. Um, but the case that I'm interested in here is that I, uh, we want to, we're interested in single view training. So even when we have multi view data. We always supervise with the same images here. So even if we, even in the case we have multiple images of the of the same CAM model, we don't explicitly have such knowledge of it. We always uh, supervise it with the same images here. Uh, the only difference is that uh, the so this would this would look a lot like an auto encoder, but the only difference is that we we do assume that we have a uh, supervision with the camera pose here. But but this is actually a lot more like an autoencoder setting, and and this is a uh, and this setting is also a lot more practical than having to know which images uh, which images corresponds to the same CAM models. And in in the real world, unless we have like some video sequences, otherwise, um, if we only have like a, a image collection, for example, from the internet, we don't we will it's never really guaranteed that we will know which images correspond to the uh, same three D shape here. So the right hand side uh, setting, you know, right hand side is the setting that we're interested in. We're interested in single view training, even when we have uh, multi view data. So even each image is, is treated in, in independently during training here. Uh, and excuse me, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, just on the previous side, just to confirm here, you are saying that you have a multi view data, but you just use single view for your training. But then, like in the next iteration, you may use a different view, right? That's what you mean, or is it that you just stick to one view? Uh, we we could take different views, but we we don't have uh, explicitly have the knowledge of that these viewpoints uh, correspond to the same objects. So they are basically treated as different objects. So we don't. Uh, the, okay. Does that? Yeah. The, the, does, does that is that clear uh, to? Uh, but you provide the camera view as an input, right? Do you? We do provide the camera pose as the input. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But what we don't we don't really know like like for for these uh three so for these uh three chairs uh here that I just showed uh, here um they're basically treated as three different chairs and we don't we don't really know like that these chairs correspond to the same cam model even in the sense that even in the scenario that we have multi view data so so these chairs will basically be treated as different cam models uh. Completely different CAM models, and we don't know what the what the other uh, other view, viewpoints would look like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we can do like a a, a comparison against uh, these uh, different prime methods. Uh, so, so just uh, as like a recap, so soft is a um, mesh reconstruction method that requires multiple viewpoints. Uh, DVR requires multiple. Uh, DVR is basically dif dif differentiable volumetric rendering, and it also requires multiple view viewpoints, but they uh, reconstruct implicit surfaces as well here. So, so we can take a look at how how um, how this setting particularly works uh, with these methods that requires multiple view supervision here. So we can see that for the input image here, and with the corresponding uh, camera post uh, supervision here. During test time, we can see that uh, SoftFresh and DVR reconstruct these three shapes pretty well uh, at the corresponding viewpoint here. So, 
it so it, it's kind of like an indication that it fits well to uh the three shape fits well to this two D silhouettes. But if we like kind of like rotate it around, we can see that it's kind of like uh it's kind of like catastrophic. Uh, if we look at it at a different viewpoint, and this is a this is a consequence of not having explicit multi-view supervision to to supervise these methods here, and and so this also speaks to what that uh, the thing that I've just been talking about about like single view training. So because because they're thinking that they will uh, because these net neural networks will think that uh, these CAD models are uh, these different views of point, point, sorry these different viewpoints are actually different CAD models. So they will only be able to fit well to the um, to the silhouettes that's uh, where the camera pose uh, is available. But if we rotate it around at a different viewpoint, then it will be uh, completely unreasonable here. So whereas uh, for our work here, we can, we can still reconstruct pretty plausible shapes here uh, at different viewpoints. And so we can kind of like uh, just uh, look at some of uh, qualitative results of uh, looking at these uh, different shares. We can see that uh, this is, this goes uh, this goes the same uh, for different shares where uh, the uh, software and DVR would kind of like reconstruct a reasonable shape at these corresponding viewpoints at, of the image. But uh, if you kind of rotate it around, then it will be uh, it will be uh, start looking unreasonable here. And, and for another category, this, this is actually uh, very similar. And if you kind of like, if we pause this DVR here, here around here. So this is actually like a, uh, a very similar viewpoint to the input image here. But if you start really like rotating it around, then you can see that it, um, the, the free shape will start looking very reasonable here. And uh, whereas, um, whereas our work, in our work, we can kind of like still reconstruct pretty reasonable three shapes. And just like qual quantitatively, uh, if we measure the chamfer distance uh, on the test set, we are much better than previous works. And so, uh, and so because we can, we can apply this, uh, our method in, in the single view training scenario, we can start looking at uh, how we can le learn these three shapes from a real world Pascal uh, data sets. So, so CMR, so CMR is the category mesh reconstruction method I talked about earlier. Um, it can, allows for single view training, but it reconstructs 3D meshes. And so what we can see here is that um, if we take, take like a test chair here, we, we can actually start to reconstruct pretty reasonable uh, implicit surfaces with, and you can notice that uh, these topology, uh, the difference in the topologies that we are able to uh, reconstruct these uh, thin bars of the back seat of the chair. Whereas uh, for meshes, it's impossible. It's really impossible for deformation-based approaches like CMR. Uh, it's really not able to handle uh, like these uh, uh, various topologies, for example, the back of the seat. And another example of like airplanes, um, we are also able to reconstruct. Uh, I, I, won't, I wouldn't say it's a very, very perfect, but we can start reconstructing pretty reasonable shapes um, from these natural images here. And I still want, and I want to emphasize that we do have to assume that we have silhouette annotations and we do have to assume that we know the camera poses here. Uh, one more question here, like hmm? uh, the shapes look very smooth. Like, did you try to like, do anything to get uh, like high frequency details, like it could be like a different position encoding or, or uh, like taking any local features. Um. So, so so for our work, we already we, we do have in positional encoding here. So, if you if you look at if you look at the chairs here, oh sorry, it's not. So if you look at the chairs there, you can see that there are actually. Uh, there are actually some like regular patterns. Uh, are, are, there are actually some like artifacts that's in the form of like regular patterns here. If you see, look at the uh, seat of the chair, you can see that it's kind of like axis aligned, and, and this is actually as uh, 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 comes from the positional coloring that we see uh, in the original nerve work, and mm -hmm. so 
um, I did kind of like try to apply the uh, more advanced Porter features uh, from, from the nurse paper last year. And it, this will get kind of like start to get rid of these like uh, regular patterns of artifacts where, where we have like um, kind of like, uh, like sign patterns of these shapes. And, and it will be helpful um, if we apply these kind of like advanced Porter features here. But, and, but and, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. No, uh, I mean like, uh, but for this one, we already do, we did already apply a uh, persistent encoding, and uh, I did experiment with uh, with uh, these uh, with SDF SR without persistent encoding, and and the results will be uh, a lot worse than uh, than not having persistent encoding here. Okay, and and are these results category agnostic? Uh, uh, in our setting, we uh, we assume that this is category is specific. So we only train like a network on only chairs, only on cars and only on airplanes, etc. Okay, and, and do you have results for uh, category agnostic as well? Is... Um, I, just just for my information. Yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't I didn't really consider a category agnostic uh, scenarios. And, and I, I, I think I think it'll be interesting, but it's not currently my, uh, it's not currently my uh, personal focus here. At the moment, but I think it's, this is an interesting problem, and I think it's going to be valuable for um, for the community as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, and this in uh, the last slide is basically uh, the quantitative results on the uh, natural images, and we can see that in terms of uh, measuring chain distance, we are still much better than uh, previous methods here. Yeah, and. And that's kind of it. And thanks for attending. And I'm happy to take any more questions if and happy to discuss further. Thanks. Cool. Is there any question for the crowd? Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm sorry if it's a stupid question. Um, yeah, sure. But um, so in your paper, you mentioned that uh, at training time, you know the camera uh, rotation and translation, mm -hmm. um, and so you can uh, transform your sign distance function with respect to the camera pose. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you also know that at test time, and for a data set like ImageNet, how do you estimate the pose and translation for those images? Yeah. So, um, so, so in this work, we so the uh, the actual network architecture is basically uh, uh, like a uh, like an image encoder that goes from the image to some latent code, and then we predict the uh, we predict the uh, what the sign distance uh, the network weights uh, the the function weights of the sign distance field. So so it's basically it's basically like a standard uh, 3D prediction uh, architecture where you just like take an image and we predict 3D shapes. So at test time, we don't really need to know what the camera pose is, but it has to be in the canonical space at, at this point. So, so we don't really need camera poses, although we did do some experiments where, uh, where, we, where we assume that we have camera poses, then we can apply some more advanced uh, techniques during test time, like test time optimization, where we assume that uh, we have the images here, uh, we know the camera pose, and then we can, um, do test time optimization on the 3D shapes, and it will give us it will still give us like much better results. But uh, for fairness, we didn't do uh, this kind of like procedure when we compare with these baseline methods. Wait, what, what, uh, what do you mean by canonical space? You mean the shape net coordinate system, or uh, like all the like all space? the like all the chairs have to be uh, facing uh, facing in the same directions. They are living in the same canonical space. I see. Yeah. Wait. So, like, so if a chair is facing on the to the right and the other chair is facing to the left, then it is not doable in the test time. Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, you need like, to know the relative transformation between these two? Well, we still need to know the relative transformation if we want to know uh, exactly what the shape is aligned on the image, how the shape is al aligned to the images. Um, because if we only have the image here, we, it, we, we're only predicting the three shapes in the canonical space. And if we want to align the predictions to the, to the uh, test images, we still need to know the relative transformations. 
I see. And and do you think that's like a major bottleneck for this method to scale to something like ImageNet? I think I think there are different problems uh, with ImageNet because um, I think I I think like for for example like uh, so category uh, so getting out of the category specific scenario is one problem I think so this is I think this is actually one very important problem but um, and I'm not I'm not even sure if SDMSRM really works if we just like train across like a gener generic category. Um, I think like for a lot of these natural images, one other problem is that uh, there are actually a lot of occlusions going on within these uh, image net uh, images. For example, we, we might have like uh, like a multiple cars in the parking lot and that's being, that's one occluding another. And we're, these, uh, these appearance cues might not be very, very useful if we want to Use them as a uh, as a provision with with like silhouettes, and um, I think I don't think camera poses is particularly a very very uh, difficult problem because there are some methods that allows us to recover camera poses from annotated key points. So this there are some works in our lab and some works in in fair that uh, tries to uh, that trains try to aim to tackle the problem of jointly recovering 3D key points and camera poses from just like learning from 2D key points. So if we know that we have a uh, category specific uh, key point annotations, then we, there is a problem, uh, there is a way of recovering uh, these relative camera poses just from key points. So I think this is a, a relatively minor problem. And this is also one of the interesting directions uh, in this regard, because I think like key point annotations are really, really cheap. So if we took, and it takes a lot, lot less um, manual effort than having to align these like ground truth camera poses in 3D. So, so I think this is also one direction I'm interested in, in is like uh, using practical sources of supervision to, um, to obtain these necessary information like camera poses that, that's necessary for 3D reconstruction. I see, I see. I have I have another question. Um, uh, so I think like when you publish this work, it's like I, I think even till now, it's probably still the the only work that tried to learn uh, to recover the surfaces from single image domain. But then later on, there are works like Graph. I don't know whether you know it. It's generative neural yep. radiance flow, and yep. also PyGAN. Mm -hmm. um, they they can also train on this kind of data. Uh, or basically when you don't even have the motif supervision. But I believe they don't explicitly recover the surface, uh, but then they will allow you to do more realistic rendering. And what's your thoughts on like works along that line? Because I, I feel like that is pretty related to yours, except that they don't explicitly recover the surfaces while they can also use some other methods like margin cubes or you know, like in Nerve, you can also use some way to determine the depth of your rendering. And, uh, mm -hmm. and in that case, it will be very similar to your stuff. So yeah, I just wonder like your thoughts on, well, these two things merge together or like which direction is more <laughs> scalable in the future? Um, I, th I think like depend, I think this depends on uh, what you want from these kind of like methods. Uh, so for, for example, some, some people, what explicit explicit surface representations. So if is if people want like explicit surfaces, for example, if we want to like reconstruct the surfaces of a of a three D thing or a three D object, if you actually want these surfaces, then um, then you probably have to have a way of modeling um, these uh, uh, explicit uh, have have to have a way of explicitly extracting these surfaces from the from the implicit functions. And some and for, for taking like Nerf for example, uh, Nerf doesn't really ex ex explicitly model uh, these object surfaces, but people might not really care about object surfaces if you want to not, like use Nerf for something else. So I think it, it depends on the application that you want to go for. Um, I think like for graph, uh, if if they, uh, I think they are, if I remember correctly, um, they don't really explicitly model uh, explicit surfaces, but that might not be their uh, 
uh, they, that not they might that might not be their interest either. So, I think it depends on the application that you wanted to go for. I see. So you so you're saying like if you want the surface, then you should model it explicitly instead of going through a detour where you only care about the view synthesis and then you try to use marching cubes or some other ways to extract the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my personal opinion. Okay. Yeah. Nice. I did. I did try to use like GANs to 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 uh, to apply on th on this work. Uh, from my very very initial experience, I did try using GANs to like reconstruct these uh, surfaces from shape nets. It actually works really well with GANs. If, if you just like take a bunch of like shape net images and the silhouettes and just like run uh, like train a GAN on these uh, shape net images, uh, it actually works really well. And you can uh, actually try to generate a different uh, different shapes uh, using like a category, category specific setting, but it, it just like completely fails when we go on natural images here. So, and, and, the, and, and the approach was like a, bit, a, lot, a lot more different than, a lot different than what I uh, finally approach here, uh, propose here. So I, th I think GANs are still a useful tool to consider, but uh, I'm not sure if this will be uh, exactly useful for uh, for the scenario uh, that we're discussing here, so, but I think I still I still think it's very interesting. Uh, I have yet another question. So sure. there are a lot of like, is there a specific reason of choosing the scene representation network as a renderer or? It seems like you can actually replace it with different stuff, right? Like, like right now we have a lot of uh, follow-up works on single representation networks in, in Europe, actually. And so it's it seems to me like you can actually just do. It seems like you're proposing a framework where the single representation network can be replaced easily, or or you think like single representation single representation network is like. Uh, fundamental here. I think it's actually, I, th I think it's actually pretty crucial to this work because I think I think yeah. the advantage of using scene representation networks is that uh, uh, during training that the SRN actually you, you actually have to force SRN to um, to march forward from the camera uh, from the camera center. So so when, when like during training, if we have like multiple images here, then um, the ray drop march, the learning of the ray marching process, uh, will uh, eventually like kind of like intersect, not not exactly intersect, but they'll kind of like find the common space where the where the shape uh, where where the least deformation of the shape variance should live in. So I think I think like as the process of using uh, SRN is actually crucial to uh, f uh, finding these uh, correspondences between. Uh, multiple images a lot uh, more easily. Uh, I think I think this is a pretty crucial. Uh, I think I think this is actually a pretty crucial property of making SDF SRM work. Um, for example, like if we, it, I don't think it will actually work if we like replace SRM with like for example Nerf. I don't think this will really work at all. I see. <laughs> All right, do we have other questions? I can ask an easy question. Um, yeah. How do you resolve the depth versus scale ambiguity, ambiguity um, when you're doing the single view at test time? How do we, uh, oh, so so for the, for, the, uh, for the natural images, we assume that with the, uh, the projection is with perspective. So, um, but we, but we, do assume, we do kind of assume that we, have a, a limited range of, of the where the camera center should should live in, and, and then we and also and then we assume that we do like we perceptic uh, projection. Um, for shape that we assume that we know the camera extrinsics, and so we basically uh, model a uh, like perspective, and we don't really need to worry about uh, depth and scale ambiguities here. All right, it's two p.m. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, 
Thanks, Chen Chen, for presenting his work. And the video will be uploaded to YouTube on Friday. So, and thanks everybody for participation. Yeah. See thanks, you next week. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye bye.